The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorn was a mild-mannered graphic artist until he was bitten by the electronics bug. Now, every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're building a mailbox that communicates wirelessly with a remote indicator, telling you if there's mail inside. This has been a popular request over the years and it would be handy for people living in the country who have to drive or walk to their mailbox, or anyone else with an inconveniently located mailbox. Let's get started. But first, the news. Today in Ben News, I'd like to show you a trick I found online for making your prints stay flat on the heated build platform. You take your ABS scraps and you mix them with acetone to make like this milky slush stuff. And then as the bed is heating up, you brush on a thin layer. And what happens is it's kind of like a base, so your parts will stick really good, even without a raft. So it works great, I highly recommend it. ABS acetone slush. So, notification mailbox, mailbox alert. This is one of those ideas we've gotten several times over the years, so we thought, hey, we should finally build it. So the premise is your mailbox tells you if there's mail in it, and you might think, well, that's kind of obvious, right? Well, not always. If you're in the country, for instance, you might have a driveway that's a quarter mile long. You don't want to just drive out and see if there's mail, especially if it's like the winter or something. Sometimes, even then, your mailbox might not even be near your driveway, so you might have to walk, you know, three or four hundred feet to get to it. And, you know, for old people, they might not want to do that. So here's how it's going to work. We'll put two infrared sensors uh, up and down in the mailbox so it'll detect if there's mail in it, no matter the orientation. There'll be a battery pack in it, so, uh, you know, it's self-powered, and a wireless transmitter. And the trick here is we're going to have a uh, snap action switch that'll be set to normally closed so that when the uh, mailbox is opened, it'll turn this unit on. So it'll only transmit its status while the door is open. That way it's not using power most of the time. Finally, there'll be a device in your home or maybe your car, I don't know, that tells you if you've got mail. So, you know, you'll see that and like, oh, I guess it's worth a trip to the mailbox. So we've got our mailbox and all the other parts ready. So let's get started. We're going to start with the mailbox itself. Here are the parts that I want to use. I have some snap action switches here. We're going to use those for actually turning it on and off. Let me give you a demonstration. There's three pins on these. One is common, then one is normally open and one is normally closed. So the normal switch function that you might think about, you'd be on here, right? This is how we're going to use it. When the door is closed, like that, the switch will be closed. So we be, will be hooked up to, so we'll be hooked up to normally open. So when the door is opened, the system turns on and sends the status of the infrared. Then when the door is closed, the system is off, not consuming battery power. So we're just gonna put that right here. Then we have some infrared emitters and detectors. Slice open this bag here. There we go. Oh, I sliced open the wrong part. Wonderful. They tricked me. There we go. Now, you can't see these with your eyes, but the camera can. Let's just test this infrared LED. It should have a resistor, but I'll just do this really quickly. I'll hook it up to this three bolt battery and then I will look at it using my cell phone. And that will allow me to see the infrared. Almost any charge couple device, image sensor, we'll see in the infrared spectrum. All right, so we know it works. We'll figure out the resistor to use for it. I'm probably just gonna have a uh, four AA battery pack in this thing. Then here, let's pop these suckers out. I think I need, a, need a, uh, the pliers. Oh, another pair of wire strippers I'll never use. That was what I was gonna say on my tombstone. Like Ben lost all his teeth, but never used wire strippers. Cautionary tale. Okay, now these things are 38 kilohertz infrared detectors. And these are exactly what's on your 
remote control TV, DVD player, whatever. And uh, these see light in the infrared spectrum, but the trick is they see it at a certain frequency, uh, 38 kilohertz to be exact. However, you can usually use them as just standard detectors in there. It's a little bit easier to use because they'll just give you a one or zero as the output. It's kind of makes it easy because these are actually integrated circuits. You give them five volts ground, and then the third wire is the signal. There we go. Here we've hooked up the IR receiver sensor to these batteries, and we're going to you know, get a signal off of it. I'm gonna test it using this uh, camera remote. It's getting a reaction from the remote control, so we know that it's receiving the infrared pulses. But what we really should do is make our infrared emitter pulse at the right frequency so this detects it for sure, which is 38 kilohertz. Using a 555 timer, I'm now creating a 38 kilohertz square wave which will drive our IR. I'm going to use this potentiometer and the uh, Agilent oscilloscope to dial it in to make sure I have the right frequency. Okay, need to go up a little bit, get as close to 38 kilohertz as we can. Oh, it went a little over, all right. There, that's pretty good. All right, here is our completed test circuit. We have our infrared emitter and the detector. I'm gonna power it up. We should see a change when I interrupt the beam with my finger. Here are the XB modules we're going to use for this project. They're quite small and these can have a range of up to a mile, allegedly. You can do a lot of things with these. You can uh, transmit and receive serial data like you would with a uh, USB port. In this case though, we're gonna use our IO line passing feature. The XB has about eight lines of digital IO, so it can actually take high-low signals on this side and transmit them to the other unit, and that's the way we're going to do it. So we're gonna start by configuring the XB. We've got the XB plugged into an XB Explorer, and we can use a program called XCTU to read the XB through the Explorer. So we plug it in, we select the correct COM port, and we hit read on the XCTU, and it'll show us the parameters of this. We're gonna give it its own identification number so the two can talk to each other and you know no one else. Then for the settings, we wanna use the wire settings where basically we have these virtual wires. So four pins, for instance, on the transmitter are interconnected wirelessly, with four pins on the receiver. So uh, on the Adafruit website, they had a great example of how to do this, so I'm just following those instructions. On the receiver, we need to go down and set the data to number four low. I'll put enable to disable. This means it's going to be receiving commands and externalizing them. So if the transmitter sends a one, this one will show a one. If it has a zero, this one will show a zero. It's kind of like when ET and Elliot were both sick and they kind of had the same feelings. Okay, so I'm going to write the firmware. And I can also save a copy of it to the profile so I can have a flash of it as a file. I'm going to unplug this. Pull that out, so that's our receiver. Now we're gonna program the transmitter. And I've labeled these two so you can tell what they are. All right. Let's read the transmitter. Okay, make sure it has the same PAN ID. Okay, now the digital input output is going to be set to digital in, which is what the DI means, which means this takes signals in and sends them out to the other unit. All right, we also wanna have change detect, so when something happens, it says, oh, something changed, I'm gonna send the status that it changed. All right, that all looks good, write that one. Now that we've both written them with the same PAN ID, they will be interconnected. XBs always ship with a default number, I believe it's 3332, so they'll always talk to each other, but you know, if you go to Maker Faire, there's gonna be XBs or whatnot everywhere, so set them to your own number. And it's actually a four digit hex, which is 32 bits, so. It's plenty of different numbers to choose from. All right, now we can do a test and see if they are interconnected. So we're gonna do this now. We're gonna unplug this guy. Put him over here. Plug this guy back in. And this pin right here, that's our data pin. So we're gonna use that for monitoring. We're gonna plug this guy in. Now over here, I, this mess, <laughs> these batteries represent what's going to be in our uh, mailbox. So we're just gonna wire this guy up manually. All we need are ground, power, 
and actually that's it. <laughs> and we have a 3.3 volt regulator. So let's power this guy on. Now see this guy has connected to it. Now I'm going to hit his complementary pin here. So pin 20 on this one is actually connected now to pin 20 on that one. So when I pull this one low, that one also goes low. So now the XBs know what the other XB is doing. As someone who loves electronics, I'm always looking for ways to connect with the latest technology, top manufacturers, and modding community. That's why I've decided to take the Ben Heck Show on the road to San Jose, California for the 2013 Design West Show. Our team will be capturing show highlights, interviewing top suppliers, and showcasing all of the hottest innovations. I'll also be taking part in Element 14's Speed Training, a fast-paced training circuit where participants will learn about the latest products being embraced by the maker community, including Raspberry Pi and accessories, Arduino, and some of the hottest open source hardware and software available today, including the long-awaited next-generation BeagleBone. Element 14 is also hosting three exclusive hands-on sessions with Gert Van Lu, who created the ultimate Raspberry Pi accessory, the Gert Board. These limited space workshops explore how the Gert Board and Raspberry Pi work together, and participants will walk away with their own board. Design West happens on April 22nd through the 25th, and registration is now open at ubmdesign.com. If you can't make the show, you can still be involved. I'll be hosting a Q&A from San Jose, so use hashtag AskBenHeck or visit the Design West page on the Element 14 community to ask me anything you'd like. We'll post video responses on the community and on the Element 14 YouTube channel after the event. So whether you want to join me at the show itself or be featured virtually through the Q&A, this is your chance to be part of the Ben Heck Show and get a first-hand look at the future of electronics. Visit us at element14.com forward slash design west to learn more today. Now that we've tested out the IR sensor and the XB communication, it's time to wire up a circuit board of our breadboard and then stuff it in the mailbox. We also want to have a low voltage battery indicator that is transmitted to the receiver device just so the batteries don't die and you think no one loves you and you don't get mail anymore. We're using a uh, 3.3 volt linear regulator on the uh, mailbox itself. That will take the six volts from the battery pack and knock it down to 3.3 volts to run our circuitry as well as the uh, XB transmitter. There's a thing called dropout, and that is, here is the level the regulator outputs at, in this case, 3.3 volts, and your input voltage is gonna start at six in this project, and it starts to go low, and dropout is when the input voltage gets too low, this fails to output 3.3 volts anymore. And in the case of this regulator, the dropout's about one volt above its output, so it's about 4.3 volts. So what we're gonna do here is use an op amp to make a low battery detector, so that when the batteries get down to about 4.5 volts, it will, there'll be a light that will indicate and also send an indicator light to the receiver unit saying, hey, you need to replace the batteries in your mailbox. So we're gonna test it using these supplies. This bench supply here, I have set to six volts, so it's outputting six volts to our unit. And this multimeter is showing us what our uh, regulator is outputting. So at a certain point, you know, if there's not enough voltage, the regulator fails to output its correct 3.3 volts. So we're gonna bring this up to six. That's where we start. And this LED here indicates when we're going to get a low battery indicator. Again, uh, we're using an op amp to do this. So just go online, look up op amp low battery circuit, and there's tons of stuff you can use. So we're gonna, I have the dropout here. So 4.66. Okay, as I reduce this, once it drops past 4.5, we should get the indicator. There you go. So our transmitter still has enough energy. It's still working, but the battery indicator will come on before it dies. You've probably got about, uh, yeah, you've got about 0.25 volts of slop there before it completely fails. So it's just, you know, a good idea, battery indicator. I figured out the best way to make the transmitter and the receiver, so I'm gonna go over the parts on each of them so you can see how I did it. Here are the parts on the mailbox emitter. We have a 3.3 volt regulator here, the XB wireless communicator here. This is a 555 timer that's generating a 38 kilohertz uh, pulse signal for the infrared so it matches the sensors. 
This is a NOT gate. Several signals need to be inverted for you know best logic, so I just have it going through a NOT gate. This is an op amp, operational amplifier. We're using it as a battery uh, level detector. So once the battery gets low enough, it'll actually trigger a signal so we can tell our receiver unit, hey, the mailbox is low on batteries, you should, you should replace them. Uh, this is just a potentiometer to adjust to the op amp. Uh, these are hookups for the external lights because there's going to be a emitter, detector, emitter, detector, so four directions. Uh, so one of the detectors we have just built into this board and the other one is loose. See how we just have it taped in place. For demonstration purposes, I have one of the IR emitters just held in place here. Here is a receiver unit that will be inside your house. Again, it has a 3.3 volt regulator, capacitor to smooth it out, power input, the receiving XB, and then we do have a microcontroller here. I originally thought I could do it without any logic, but it turns out we needed some logic on this end, which I'll explain in a minute. And then, of course, we have our two indicator LEDs, a white for you have mail, and red for your battery is low. So I'm gonna give power to the receiver unit here. This will plug into your wall inside the house, but I'm just gonna hook it up to this power supply right now. I'm gonna turn it on. The lights will flash to let us know that it's on. And this is looking for a signal from this. But until it gets a signal from that, it's not gonna do anything. So I'm going to turn on this bench power supply to activate our mailbox unit. The bench power supply is gonna simulate a four pack of batteries like this. Okay. I'm gonna put the voltage to six volts. This power supply lets me adjust the voltage very accurately. Okay, six volts is the amount of voltage it would have with a full four AA battery pack. Now this thing, now that it's on, it's sending signals to this and it's sending four signals. It's sending active status, like I'm on, uh, battery status, either uh, low or good, and then vertical receiver and uh, horizontal receiver, you know, both of the directions in the mailbox. So for my first example, I'm going to lower the voltage. This is using a 3.3 volt linear voltage regulator. A linear voltage regulator needs a certain amount of voltage as input above its output for it to continue working. And uh, that's called the dropout. So if it's outputting 3.3 volts, quite often it needs at least 4.3, a whole extra volt still, to maintain 3.3. This is a low dropout voltage regulator, so we can actually lower it quite a bit. I'm gonna lower the voltage. I have uh, op amp on it, and what the op amp does is at a certain low voltage, it'll trigger a warning. There it is right there. So 3.5 volts, actually a little bit more than that. I have it about, trying to have about three and three quarters. Okay, 3.65. 3.65 volts on the batteries will trigger the low voltage alarm on your house unit so that you know the mailbox is low on power. Um, yeah, these start at six, so you've got about 2.5 volts of voltage drop before it gets there. And the regulator still works. I mean, it's a low dropout regulator, so you can have the input voltage almost down to the output voltage and everything continues to function. All right, so that's one of the things it does. The other thing it does is it has, obviously, the mail detector. Now, we have two infrared sensors here. We have the infrared emitter, and then we have an infrared receiver. And we're using the 38 kilohertz infrared receiver package, which is what you'd have on your DVD player or TV remote or whatever. And that looks for infrared that is pulsing at 38,000 know, cycles a second. So we have a 555 timer actually putting that frequency on this. So it's not just solid on IR sensor, it's blinking very rapidly. The reason they do that with remote controls is by uh, cycling the lights at that frequency, it, it has less interference from other light sources, such as you know, the lights in your, in, your, in your living room. All right, so if I interrupt this beam, the white light should come on. And that means you've got mail. So while this unit is running, you, you can actually see what's happening in real time. And I did that by tunneling these Zigbees together. You saw it's configured on the computer. The Zigbees have eight IO lines, and the IO lines on here are tunneled to this one. So when something changes on this one, it shows up on this. And uh, just being kind of lazy, I put a microcontroller here just because we needed a bit of a buffer. And the reason we needed a buffer is um, when this unit turns off, the Zigbees have a timeout period. So this one actually needed to prefetch the data from, well, I guess prefetch is not the right word. <laughs> when, this thing, when this thing is running and sending signals to this, the status is going into a buffer. That's like 1K and it's updated every five milliseconds. And when this unit turns off, the state has to be stored here. So let's say you had a low battery and you had some mail and the mailbox is closed. Now it'll store the state and it'll start blinking, that way you notice it in your house. 
So what was happening before was if you didn't have the buffer, let's say here's your most current version. Oh, the most current thing that happening is, you know, mail and low battery. As soon as the power went off, you might get a false signal, which means that this wouldn't know exactly where that left off. So by buffering it, we have the buffer pointer here filling the buffer with data, but when the unit is turned off, the buffer pointer is here, but it actually gets the um, readings from about 100 positions behind the buffer, which means it has the last current valid data. All right, so then when this turns back on again, obviously there's no mail because my hand's not in the, in the way here. And then we can also put the voltage back up. There we go. And let's just try a status with no mail or no low battery. So it shouldn't do anything. All right, so that's the theory of operation. So now we can install it in the mailbox, finally. Here are the components inside of the mailbox. So the mail can go basically in any direction or orientation and it will detect it. So I'm gonna make a false floor for this and then we'll be ready to demonstrate. And here's our false floor for the mail to sit on. Put it in place. Make sure this opto is lined up or the opening is lined up. I can just have to do it by feel. There we go. All right, so let's say this is your mailbox out of the end of your driveway. When you open it up, it turns on and starts transmitting to the receiver. So we can put the mail in, basically any orientation, and the receiver will light up. We can pull it out, the receiver will turn off, put it back in and leave it there. And when we close it, the last update it sent was that there was mail inside, so the receiver will stay on. So there you go, at long last, the remote detection mailbox. Today's viewer question comes from Andrew, who is wondering about the liquid crystal display we used on the solder reflow oven episode. Andrew, that was a very common LCD using the Hitachi 44780 interface. Almost every two or four line green LCD display you'll come across uses this very common format. Therefore, all popular microcontrollers have libraries to drive it. Again, that is Hitachi 44780. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're gonna work on some pinball. I'll show you the progress on my Ghost Squad pinball game and go into detail on matrixing, which is an old school technique that's still useful today. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS, where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.